Oh, no, I have just another 40 seconds of awkward silence. You should tell a joke. I'm going to 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 tell a joke. Sherlock Holmes and John Watson went camping in the woods. In the middle of the night, Sherlock Holmes shakes John Watson awake and asks John, what do you see? John says, well, I see the stars above me, and uh, scientifically, that tells me there are many worlds like our own. Philosophically, it tells us that we are small in a vast universe. And religiously, it means that they, I don't know, I don't forget that part, not more. <laughs> and then John asks, Sherlock, what do you see? And Sherlock says, well, I see that someone has stolen our tent. <laughs> okay, nice. So on that note, welcome to today's CFA Colloquium. Uh, so we're really delighted to have Viviana Guzman, uh, well, not so much coming as coming back to the CFA to uh, to present her work to us. Uh, so Viviana is originally from Chile, but did her PhD in France at, at Grenoble and at Paris. Uh, she then joined us here as a postdoctoral fellow in 2013. Yes, uh, <laughs> I got that right. I was here for, for three years, uh, working mostly on ALMA data, looking at the chemistry in plant-forming disks. Uh, she then returned to Chile to, as a postdoc at ALMA for two years, and about a year and a half ago, uh, joined the faculty at the Católica in Santiago. Uh, so we're really excited to hear about what you have been up to in the past few years. So, Viviana, please. Okay, thank you, Karen. Um, so yes, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I've been doing. Um, I've been teaching also and doing very not fun stuff, but I'm going to tell you about the fun stuff that I've been able to do. <laughs> um, and it's something that a lot of you are very interested. I'm very lucky to have this crowd of uh, a lot of people interested in chemistry in project planetary disks. But I'm going to focus on a simple molecule um, carrying uh, nitrogen. So. That didn't work. <laughs> oh no. Sorry. Okay. There's one button that turns the screen off. So we really? hit it. Yeah, there's a button. There. It's yeah. up on the yeah. yeah. Find that button again. Okay, I'm just going to use this because I don't want to lift it up. Okay. Uh, uh, no, it's not, it's not, not here. It's on the it's TVs. <laughs> oh, yeah. So the TV indeed. Turn the screen off. Oh. Oh. That's interesting. Okay. We've got the last there. That's the blank screen. Yeah, they're all on such uh, great. Would be all. No, I wouldn't do that. While you're getting this ready, is the mic on? I think so, yes. Oh, it is now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, wasn't, uh, okay. it wasn't amplifying too well. Maybe you could move okay, it. Okay, we're going to use these. <laughs> okay. Yay. Mm -hmm. um, okay, just as a brief uh, summary to remind us all, um, star formation and planet formation, right? You start from this. Um, dense molecular cloud that is collapsing and it's cold inside. Eventually, we form a protostar, um, and around this protostar, we get these protoplanetary disks that, um, with time, it starts to dissipate the gas uh, around it. Um, and eventually, from this, uh, we get to something like this uh, a planetary system. Uh, so the disks that, the disks that I'm more interested in are, well, in this stage, but after most of the um, uh, envelope material has already been dissipated, so we can see the protoplanetary disk uh, more clearly um, with the observations. Um, so some of the general questions that we try to um, understand, we don't have answers for most of these. <laughs> um, so first, uh, we want to know what kind of what is the uh, chemical inventory in protoplanetary disks. 
thanks to Alma, we now now um, have um, um, an answer for this. At least we know what are the most abundant species that we can detect. Um, we also want to know uh, how this chemistry is changing depending on the physical condition of the disk. So for example, the star, if you have a more massive star or a more or a less massive star, the radiation field is going to be different and this will have a big impact on the chemistry of the disk. But also what is the, uh, the environment um, around these, these new, newly formed core stars. For example, it's very different if you form a star in a very isolated place, right? Um, which is actually the case that we study the most because it's easier. <laughs> But uh, a lot of stars form in clusters, right? So for example, in Orion, where you have a lot of OB stars and a lot, a lot of things happening around, um, that would also have an impact. It might have a big impact on the chemistry that we have in these uh, young stars and, <coughs> and their disks. Um, and what finally, something that I, I would like to know, uh, but this will take longer to answer, <laughs> is to really uh, understand the whole evolution from the pre-stellar phase, right, to the protoplanetary disk, and then and what um, um, and then finally to the planetary uh, system. Um, so for example, we don't know if um, maybe the chemistry is not changing too much in the disk. Well, we know it does, but <laughs> we don't know how much and which, which species are changing the most. Uh, and maybe a lot of the material that is um, formed or, or that comes from the preschooler stage is preserved uh, and can be incorporated into planetary systems. Um, just to remind us, uh, disks are not a uh, pancake, right? They're not flat. They're not flat. They have a structure. Uh, so you have uh, dust and gas, obviously. Um, you have big grains and small grains. Um, and due to the radiation of the star, you have uh, temperature uh, gradients, right? Both radially and vertically. Uh, that would, will make uh, the chemistry to be uh, behaving in, um, in, in layers, right? You have a surface layer that is due, um, where you have a lot of photochemistry, so basically a PDR. And then when you go to deeper layers and the temperature drops, you have a lot of ion molecule chemistry and then eventually a lot of ices and um, very complex uh, chemistry that can happen uh, in the midpoint of these disks. Um, when we look at the distribution, uh, this is kind of an old image now, well, <laughs> not so many years, but it's already older. Um, the dust presents uh, a lot of structure, right? So we know by now that there are a lot of rings, uh, spirals or double rings, multiple rings. Um, complicated distribution of the dust. Uh, this is the more recent view of uh, D-Sharp, uh, we have Sean here and Jane, who uh, did a lot of this work uh, with other people. And here you can really see that uh, when you look any disk with a high enough uh, angular solution, you're going to start seeing uh, some kind of a uh, structure. Um, and this structure can vary, well, grains are very common, but you can also have these very nice uh, um, spirals or uh, for example, here you can see some spirals here as well. Uh, some sources have uh, large uh, gaps. Um, and one very good example of uh, large gaps uh, is A29. So this is uh, the disk up here, where you have this very large uh, dust gap at around 100 AU. Um, so this is just the distribution um, of the surface brightness uh, profile function of radius where you can see the location of all of these different uh, rings. So this is one of the most extreme. Some other disks have a um, much um, closer in um, multi uh, multiple rings as well. Um, in the case of this one, um, um, it's very likely that there is a planet that could be explaining the, the, the distribution of all of these uh, rings. Um, in particular, there's a paper by Sala in 2018. Um, who just put in one planet here at 100 U more or less, he could reproduce the presence of these two gaps here, uh, and also the nested uh, uh, rings that you see in the inner part of the disk, just by putting one planet, which is pretty impressive. Um, so by now, a lot of people are more convinced, not completely sure, but <laughs> um, more convinced that uh, all of these gaps, or some of these gaps, um, are actually being produced by the presence of uh, planets that are carbon them. Um, so when we look at the gas, which is the part that I am more interested in, um, we also see some structure. So in this case, you have the same disk, but you have the emission of 12 CO. Uh, so you have some channel maps in the top. The two um, ellipses in white here are marking the position of the two uh, dust, um, dust rings. <coughs> the, two bright dust rings. Uh, the first thing that you see is that CO is much more extended, right? 
And beyond the dust per millimeter edge, you see this um, another gap here at around 210 AU. So perhaps another planet is uh, present there, its own visibility. But this is CEOS. It's one of the simplest uh, lines that we can see in this uh, because it's bright. We, we are interested, obviously, in other uh, molecular lines. Um, so when you look at the emission of other lines, you also see uh, a lot of structure, depending on what you see, uh, which line you are looking at. Um, of course, here it will depend. Well, the structure is not uh, telling you uh, always something about the density or the abundance of that molecule. There's a factor of chemistry involved, right? So like citation, higher temperatures, lower temperatures, uh, etc. So all of these lines gives you a lot of information that you can use to um, constrain what is the physical structure or the temperature or the ionization fraction, etc. Um, in this piece. Um, so this is a plot from one of Carrie's <laughs> paper, the SMA survey, uh, just to show you that the, uh, there are a lot of lines that we can detect now in this. So this is with the SMA. Um, now with ALMA, we can also <coughs> see other lines. Um, so there are a lot of things that we can do. Um, but as I said, okay, if we want to um, make a link with the um, for example, origins of life, which is something that a lot of people are very interested in, right? We want to know which uh, lines are more uh, important to trace this, um, this kind of chemistry. Um, Darwin, a long time ago, where it said that they made everything uh, started in a warm little pond. Um, and in this case, there were very simple species here that could trigger a lot of very complex chemistry that eventually uh, led to life. So with that note, one of the simplest lines um, or molecules that uh, are very important uh, for origins of life is HCN. Um, this is just a paper that I found uh, where they do computational analysis, but I think a lot of people are very convinced now that HCN is truly um, important for this. Uh, so for example, um, they think that uh, HCN could have been the starting point for uh, the production of the precursors of RNA and also of the protein. Um, so even though from HCN to actually life, of course, there's a big, <laughs> a lot of stuff happening in between. This is kind of the starting point. So it's it's important to know um, where it is in a disk, is it in a disk, how abundant it is, how common it is uh, in different disks, etc. Um, more importantly for us, for people doing observations, is that it's bright. <laughs> so we want something that we can actually observe. Uh, HCN is actually bright in disk. So this is um, a figure from Jenny Berger's uh, paper. Uh, from last year, where he presented that survey of uh, many disks um, in different lines, but just here I'm just marking the emission of HCN, where you can see that it's actually bright and it's easy to detect in many different disks. Um, but another question now, uh, so going back to this evolution of the chemistry, um, is the chemistry actually changing during the disk phase? Because if not, maybe we can just go back to studying crystal cores, seeing how much HCN is there, <laughs> and just um, um, be happy with that, right? Uh, so one of the questions that we want to know is how much the chemistry or the initial HCN abundances are changing uh, during the protoplanetary disk uh, phase. And one very um, useful tracer to, to, to study this is to look at isotopic ratios. Um, so another example is uh, D2H, so in the case of HCN, the one that is more popular is the 14N over 15N ratio. Um, this is a, um, an interesting story, though, with a lot of questions, <laughs> actually. Uh, so when you look at the um, fractionization ratio in HCN and other molecules, and 2 for example, um, across the solar system, you can find uh, a lot of variation. Uh, so here, for example, uh, well, this is from a review of Fury and, and, and Mary in 2015. Just want to note that um, in astronomy, we usually measure the 14N over 15N. In other fields, they measure the ratio that we around or the measure of percentage. So when you look at this kind of plot from different scientists, you, you may get very confused <laughs> if the trend is going down and up. Uh, so in this case, you're, you're, you're seeing the 14N over 15N ratio here. Um, so the main variations that you find is that if you look at the fertilization ratio in the sun, um, you find that it's uh, very depleted in 15N, so the ratio is about 440. So it's the, the, the most depleted one when you look at the D2H 
different uh, bodies in the solar system and also in the ISM. When you look at the value on Earth, it's a bit higher, 272. And then when you look at comets, uh, the values are even lower. Uh, and they're all very consistent and also um, for different uh, species. For, so for example, CN or XCN, they all show very similar fractionization <laughs> ratios of about 150. Uh, so there's a lot of variation in our um, own solar system. And then of course, if you go to the interstellar medium, so molecular clouds, crystal cores, etc., uh, there's a range of value. Um, some of them are really enriched in 50 n and some of them are not so much. And also here you start to see a large variation depending on the molecule that you use to trace these uh, fractionization ratios. So for example, HCM will have a different uh, ratio compared to, in this case, the ammonia that's shown here. But it's much more depleted in 50 n um, So by seeing this, um, gradient, uh, you might think, okay, so might, this might be related to uh, the chemistry that you had in the protoplanetary disk, right, was the natural fraction, fractionation changing as a function of distance from the star, also there might have been uh, different reservoirs of uh, nitrogen, right, some that are more depleted in the 15 n some of them that are more enriched. Um, so this is, okay, this is kind of a nice figure from this review, this is my simplified view of the same, <laughs> just a simplified thing. So this again is the 14n over 15n. Uh, you have the solar value there of about 440. Oh, yeah, one thing, okay. So this ratio is the same, but note that the scale is going down here, and <laughs> mine is going up. So this is the kind of stuff that I meant. It's just kind of confusing. <laughs> okay, so in this case, the sun, very depleted in 15n. Then you have a solar system. Uh, Earth 272, comets 150, some um, crystal cores in this case, and uh, for this range, and an obvious question, right, is what happens in protoplanetary disks. Uh, so before ALMA, we had we were not able to detect this line, the HCN, <coughs> because these are weak lines. Um, but with ALMA, obviously, we started to see new stuff. Uh, this was very exciting. So this is something that we detected in two, two, 2015 with Karin. Um, the first detection of a <coughs> in one uh, herbic uh, A star and WC for A. Um, so now we can put our little point here. Uh, and what we found actually, although the error was a bit uh, big, um, well, uh, not so small, but the measurement that we were getting for the vaccination ratio is actually quite similar to what you see in um, the cold ISM and also in comets. So definitely enriched with, with respect uh, to the solar value. Um, of course, that's what just one source. Uh, we always want to have some kind of statistics, or the, the, that is something that is very hard to do in chemistry, unfortunately. <laughs> we always deal with samples of six, uh, ten maybe. Well, Jenny now did 12, I think, it was like the biggest number I've seen by far. Um, so, yeah, we do what we can. Um, so, in 2017, uh, thanks to a deuterium survey that uh, Karin and Jane published, uh, we also detected um, HC15N in five of, no, in six of these, no, yes, five of the six sources that were uh, targeted. Uh, so you can see here, you have in the moment one maps uh, for H13CN and HC15N. And in these panels, I'm just showing the red and blue shifted velocities, um, just so you can see the capillary motion of the disk. And this helps us to confirm that it's actually a, a disk there um, when the lines are um, very weak. Um, so we can put more points in our uh, panel here. So now we just we don't have just m 80 but we have a lot of disks. And what was a bit surprising is that, that they all have very similar fractionation ratios, um, all around within 100 and 200. Um, and if you look at these disks, um, they're actually quite different. So here you have four Tauri stars, so lower mass, two Herbig A stars, where we expect the temperature to be much higher. Um, their sizes are different, their ages are different, so you could have expected to find different fractionation ratios, but when you look at the disk average, average ratios, um, they're all pretty much consistent, and they're all very similar to values, uh, to cometary values. Um, so let me now go through what are the different um, fractionation uh, pathways that can, be, that can happen in this. Um, so this is just part two, where we expect to have um, 
or ice is in the middle, colder, mm -hmm. and then our surface is uh, warmer. So one possibility is that everything is inherited from the ASM, right? And not much is happening in the, in the disk. Another possibility to uh, produce H-C15N is at low temperatures, uh, where you have um, efficient isotope exchange reactions. And then when you have uh, photons, you can also have um, what is called a selective photodissociation, which is mainly the ability of the main isotope block, 14N2, to cell shield uh, in comparison to the 15N, and this makes uh, atomic 15N more abundant in the gas, and this one will go into HC15N, increasing the ratio of 14N15N um, and and in HCN. This obviously will be more important in the inner part of the disk and in the surface where you have a lot of RUV, uh, RUV photons present. Um, so what could you expect to see if any of this mechanism is dominating uh, in the observations? So if everything is inherited, right, you shouldn't expect this fractionization ratio to be changing too much across um, the disk. So you could expect a flat profile as a function of radius. If the cold pathway is dominating, this will be more important in the other disk where it's colder. So you should expect to see a fractionation ratio that is decreasing with the radius. And in the other mechanism, selective photo dissociation, this will be more important in the inner disk where you have more photons. So you should expect to see an increasing profile of the fractionation ratio with radius. Easy, right? So you can just go observe and see which one matches. <laughs> um, Okay, before that, um, another way to uh, disentangle between at least the whole formation pathway and the selective dissociation is to compare to another um, fractionation ratio, isotopic ratio, that is the DCN over HCN. So in this case, these are values taken from a James paper, 2017. So it's the same disk. Uh, and actually, these observations were done simultaneously, if I'm correct. Um, so the ratios are, um, so we don't have any problems with the calibration, for example, where we take it, where we compare these two um, ratios. So um, what we see in this, or what we don't see here, it's a lack of a correlation. Uh, so this tells us that the cold uh, formation pathway is probably not the one that it's uh, producing the fractionation ratios in nitrogen that we are observing, uh, because otherwise there should be some correlation with the uh, DCN over HCN ratio, um, maybe. It's one uh, hint that probably the cold formation pathway is not the dominant one. Um, but I like more the, the idea of trying to see if we can resolve the profile to see if it's increasing or decreasing. But for that, of course, you need to have very high or good enough angular resolution so that, that you are able to uh, resolve these profiles across the disk. Um, fortunately, in our sample, there was one disk over here that you probably already uh, um, saw, V4046 dash. Uh, so this is a transition disk. There is a binary in the middle. It's quite old also, so it's kind of a um, weirdo <laughs> in this sample. Uh, but this one has very bright HCN isotopal log emission, as you can see in comparison uh, with all the other um, disks. So uh, this is our solution here in the beam. So you can see that we can try to uh, see if we can resolve this isotopic prof uh, ratio profile across the disk. Um, so that's what we did in 2017. So this is the flux ratio that we found um, for H13CN over HC15N. And in, in, in orange, there is a model that we uh, fitted. And our best fit model actually uh, was a model that had an increasing profile as a function of radius. Although again, the beam is over there, so <laughs> We call this the tentative uh, increasing profile uh, of the fractionation ratio we radius. <laughs> um, but if this is true, then uh, this is consistent to our selective uh, photodissociation um, scenario that it's more important in the inner disk compared to the cold pathway uh, that should happen in the other disk. So after that, of course, we wanted to confirm that, and we asked for higher angular uh, resolution uh, observations with Alma. Um, in this case, we also went to another band, band 7. The previous observations were the 3D2 lines, so band 6. Uh, so this gives us some information on the, on the excitation. And these are the, the new observations, um, where you can see now that we actually resolved the inner hole uh, that we've seen uh, also in the dust and in other lines. And these are the profiles of the three lines, HCN, H13CN, and HC15N. 
And now this is our resolution, so we have a much better resolution <laughs> compared to the previous ones. So we can really now disentangle um, or confirm if this profile is increasing or decreasing as a function of our radius. And just by looking at these two um, profiles, you can see that this one is much steeper in the other part, so that already gives you um, a clue of what we're gonna what we're gonna find. Um, so doing the fractionation ratio uh, of the fluxes, this from the fluxes, um, we found well two things. One by it, that it's increasing as a function of radius, but also that in the inner disk you can find very um, low fractionation ratios, so low values of the 14n over 15n uh, between 50 and 100, actually, between um, inside 15 AU. And that's pretty low compared to the values that we were seeing in comets of about 150. One thing that nobody has asked, but maybe you are wondering, we are using always uh, H13CN as a tracer of uh, the column density of HCN. This is because HCN is optically thick, uh, so you cannot trace the total plan density, while at 13 cm, we expect it will be um, optically thinner at least. Um, so we can use a 12C over 13C ratio, uh, standard one, to convert the H13 cm column density to a H HCN column density. But this is something that we just usually assume, also in the ASM, uh, but it would be very nice to be able to actually measure it, to know if, it's, um, if this value is actually correct. Um, so yes, one question is, what is actually the 12C over 13C uh, um, ratio in this? And one um, interesting thing about this data set and some other data set that we're starting to see now, uh, when you have a good signal to noise and uh, res uh, spatial resolution, HCN has an hyperfine structure, and uh, this hyperfine structure allows you to derive um, um, Better the column density because the satellite lines are much optically thinner than the main line that it's usually what you see when you have uh, um, low signal to noise uh, data. <coughs> so in this example, so the HCN for the three line looks like that. And what you see in the channel maps that are shown here in colors in the panels, um, yeah, also there's a video there. So you mm -hmm. see first the a faint um, first component. <laughs> That would be the first uh, satellite line. Then you see this main line across the channel map. That's the brightest, the, the more optically thick line. And then you start um, to see another little um, uh, line. And that would be the third uh, satellite line. So you can actually uh, use this information to try um, and get a better um, estimate of the total Coulomb density of HCN using directly the, the HCN line. Um, so in this case, I'm just showing the deprojected profiles on the top, and here in the bottom, uh, you have um, um, the spectra average of different uh, ready. Um, um, now there are very nice tools we've seen yeah, this week, so fish would have done this so much easier. <laughs> uh, uh, before, um, a year ago, uh, we have to do this on our own. Um, but anyway. Um, so you can see very clearly that at higher radius, for example here 120, 180, and even at 60 AU, you can really separate the hyperfine uh, satellites from the main line that is optically uh, thick. So doing that, you can estimate the column density of the different isotope logs. Uh, that's what is shown here. Column density profile function of radius. HCN is on the top. Here you have the two isotope logs. Obviously, in the inner part of the disk where the uh, lines are just broader, you cannot really separate the lines, so that's why we are not trying to estimate the HCN column density there because it's, uh, it's more difficult. So, um, all of these um, column density ratios are decreasing uh, as a function of the radius. Um, here I'm showing the 12C over 13C ratio that we get. Um, something that we're very happy to see is actually that this ratio is very flat uh, across the disk where we can measure it and the value that we get is very similar to what we were, we were assuming at the beginning of a localized M value of um, about 6 to 70 or so. So that's good news because it means that we can actually go and just use H13CN when we cannot separate the hyperfine structure in HCN and use this one uh, to trace the total flow density of HCN. Um, this value that we find actually is very consistent with other measurements that uh, people have found, for example, here in a comet, this was from last year, 
um, where they were finding the value of uh, 88, so a bit uh, higher, but not so much. And also ATW Hyper now that I'm going to show uh, later, they also measure a value of 86 or so uh, for the 12C over 13C. Um, so this uh, fractionation ratio is not too enriched in 13C. Um, so we can we know this value, but we can use the oscillations of H13C. Um, here is the profile of uh, the 14N over 15N. So this is the one that we actually want to measure. Um, and here you have, well, here you see more clearly that the fractionation ratio um, it's increasing as a function of the uh, radius, right? In the inner part, again, we get values between 50 and 100, while in the outer disk, uh, beyond uh, 40 or 50 uh, AU, uh, you start to recover the cometary-like values of about between 100 and 200 or so. So there is a gradient. Our previous observations, lower um, <coughs> and lower solution, were actually correct. Uh, here, so this is what I've done so far. Uh, I had a student last semester, Javier Diaz, an undergrad, um, who actually went and tried to do these toy models to uh, recover the, the abundance structure and quantify how, how um, steep was actually this profile. Uh, so for this, she, she took a density interpreted structure and used a simple primary parametric uh, function to describe the abundance of its 13 cm and its 15 n um, and fit the data um, and see what was the, the results. So in this case, I'm just showing the channel maps of the observation, her best fit model, and then the residuals. So just that you see uh, that this, this models actually work. And what she found is that H13CN has a slope of about minus um, 0.5. And in the case of HC15N, it's steeper uh, with a, um, a power law of minus 1.3. So confirming our results, um, this is just to show you that this is something that I wanted to mention actually for people that do this kind of stuff. <laughs> Always important to look at their residuals. Uh, this looks pretty good actually, but then when you go and look at the profile, sometimes they don't look as pretty. <laughs> so it's always good to look at, at both. Uh, don't just trust the, the profiles that you're getting from your best uh, fit models. In this case, they're, they're not too bad, but they're not, uh, they're not perfect. Um, okay, so getting that, um, this would be the column density ratio of H13CN over HC15N as a function of radius, and that's just the power law that you get um, from the fitting of these two lines. So the fractionation ratio is increasing as a function of radius with a power law of about 0.8. Um, and this means that in the inner part of the disk, the fractionation levels are actually pretty low, so below 70 in the inner 20 AU. Um, and then in the other disk, they are more similar to what you find in comments, so about 150. Um, yeah, this is uh, just the, the, the um, profiles of the fluxes in comparison with our best fit model, just showing that it's a, it's a good uh, fit. Um, so, okay. So now if you want to put this... Um, or compare these values to what you find in the rest of the solar system and in the um, ISM. So this is kind of a similar plot to what we had before. So again, you have the sun, uh, Earth there, then uh, disks, and here um, uh, ISM values. Um, B4046 stash are old. Disk average vaccination ratio was here, right? Now, if you separate these in the inner and the outer part of the disk, you start to see some differences. Um, so this is interesting because if we did the same for all of the disks, uh, maybe we find the same, maybe we don't, but it will tell us something that it actually matters where a planet is actually accreting its material. If you are closer to the star, you might get more enriched in 15N than if you are in the other part of the disk. Okay, um, this was one source that we are studying in much detail. <laughs> As I mentioned, we tried to get some statistics, but this is very hard. <laughs> So I have a sample of two for this. Uh, this is another disk where we have observations of uh, HC and isotopologs, uh, TW Hydra. This is one of the most studied, most studied disks. Um, this one doesn't have the hole that B4046 has, but it's also pretty old. So in that sense, they are um, kind of similar. Um, in this case, we have uh, two lines in band six and band seven. So that gives us some information on the excitation. 
Um, unfortunately, we were a bit too slow to publish this. <laughs> a paper came out uh, last year uh, where they uh, analyzed the band uh, seven data, so the four to three lines. So these are the same that I'm showing here, just kind of prettier. <laughs> um, okay, so this is what they, they found. Um, so they, they tried to do the same thing, right? To see if the isotopic vaccination was uh, changing as a function of distance from the star. In this case, they also had HCN, so they could also retrieve the HCN column density directly using the hyperfine structure of this one. Um, and what they found, and it's the blue, sorry, the red boxes, that's the HCN over HC15N uh, ratio. And um, you see again that the, the, the data is saying that this ratio is increasing as a function of radius. And in this case, they find a, a slope of 1.3. Um, in this case, the values in the inner disk are not so extreme as the one that we are finding in the V4046 stash. So they just go from 120 at uh, 20 AU and then to 340 in the 40, uh, 45 AU. So they are a bit larger than what we have in the 4046 stash. Um, and again, as I mentioned, they uh, measure the 12C over 13C ratio. So this is the value that I was saying before. They found a value of 86. Um, on average, and it's pretty flat. It's the, this, the screen lines here. It's pretty flat across the disk, so, so it's not changing too much. Um, okay, so something new that we can do though with the data that we have is that we have the three to two lines, and this gives us some information on the excitation, so where the, the emission layer is coming from in the disk. Um, so in our case, we find very similar values when you take the flux ratios. Um, but we went uh, and tried to do the similar study that what we did for the 4046 dash to um, um, use simple parametric models to try to fit the data and find and quantify this uh, power law. Uh, so we started actually with a simple uh, one component, uh, one power law, uh, with a lower limit uh, that we changed between 0.1 and 0.2, and then an upper limit uh, where everything is just uh, dissociated. So in the, in, in the inner part, Sorry, in the bottom part, below the blue line, everything is just frozen because the temperatures are low. Um, I was playing with these <coughs> models for a long time, <laughs> and no matter which set of parameters I chose or which lower boundary, I was always getting a lot of residuals here. So here are just channel maps again, observations, models, and residuals. Um, so I went back to think, and I remember that when you look at the continuum uh, profile, <coughs> Uh, that it looks like this. Um, there are kind of two slopes. So the inner part of the disk, uh, about below 30 or 25 AU, you have a much steeper slope compared to the other part of the disk. So you could try to break this uh, in two parts. And the reason that I looked at the continuum is because HCN usually follows the distribution of, um, of the continuum machine. HCN is always um, compact and it's really tracing a similar distribution. So maybe this could help us to get a better fit. Um, so what I'm doing is that, just separate it, one power law in the inner part and another power law in the outer part of the disk. And actually by doing that, um, I, I was able to get a much better fit. Um, also the lower limit that I could find for the boundary of where we put our H30, uh, HC15N and H30CN, it's about 0.14. Uh, that means the, that the emission is coming from a rather um, temperate layer of about uh, above actually 30, 40 Kelvin or so. So that would be the result for H13CN. We still get some residuals, but we cannot do perfect. But it, it was much better than, than what I was getting when I was just using one A power law. Um, again, the same for H HC15N. This is weaker, so it was a bit easier to do. Um, and just to check that this model can actually reproduce, um, well, we actually are, are, are fitting these together. So uh, this model is able to reproduce the 4 to 3 lines as well as the 3 to 2 lines. And that's important because we want to be able to fit both uh, together. So what you get with this is actually that the abundance profile in the inner and outer disk are different. Uh, in the inner part, so here you have the column density ratios, and here it's the the ratio between HCN and HC15N uh, as a function of radius for the three different models, uh, just changing the lower boundary that we are using. This is the best fit that we find. And what you get is that in the inner disk, um, 
the vaccination ratio is not changing too much, and we recover values of about 120 in the inner disc. And then in the other part of the disc, um, the vaccination ratio is actually much higher. And it's decreasing as a function of radius. And this is something that uh, Pierre Villant actually mentioned in his paper, that he was getting this, uh, the red profile right, it's increasing, and then at the bottom, at the end, at the edge of the disc, uh, he was finding that it was going down again. And this is exactly the same that we get when we do these uh, parametric models with similar values. So that, that's good. OK. Um, another story. So, so far, I've just talked about uh, HCN isotopologs. Uh, you could use <coughs> other uh, molecules to try to measure this uh, fractionation ratio, for example, CN. Uh, this is something that was done by uh, Hilbert in 2017 in TW Hydra. Um, and where he found that CN was actually not enriched, so very depleted in 15N compared to HCN. Uh, so the value was 3 uh, to 3 compared to HCN, where the values are uh, 120. Um, yeah, I'm putting a range here because it's increasing, but the average is uh, 200 or so, so it's uh, lower than CN. Um, this uh, led the people to think that maybe <coughs> there are two um, reservoirs of nitrogen uh, in discs at the time of the formation of these uh, of giant planets. And that comets would be uh, tracing the reservoir that came from HCN, for example. Um, so one question that I have, at least, that, that I'm not so sure that this is actually true, and one thing that we need, really need to be sure is that we know where CN is actually coming from. Um, because remember that we have not just radial uh, radians, we also have vertical radians. So if HCN is coming from a different layer than CN, uh, we also might expect to have gradients uh, vertically uh, for the fractionation ratio. Um, so we have observation actually of CN um, and very weak uh, C15 end lines. Um, but just from the theory of what we expect CN to be forming, um, so this is a work by Paolo Casaletti in 2018, where he tried to explain why CN had a ring um, a distribution in, in, in actually all of the disks. Um, and what he found with his model that was uh, able to reproduce this, so in this case you have the color density as a function of the radius, just to show that HCN is centrally picked, while CN is actually a ring. So they have different distributions. But chemically, what is happening is that uh, to form CN, um, you really need to um, to excite um, vibration, vibrationally excite H2. Um, this will happen uh, in more in the surface layers and in the inner disk, where you have a lot of photons that can excite uh, um, H2. So you should expect to see CN coming from a higher layer than uh, HCN, actually. And that is what we've shown here. So this will be the same. The abundance, but instead of a function of radius, it's a, it's a function of a height at a certain radius. Uh, you see HCN is here between 20 and 45 uh, AU, more or less, while CN is a bit shifted and you have emission higher up in the surface, up to about 60 AU. So they will be tracing uh, different layers. Um, and if this is true, uh, then the different fractionation ratio that we observe might actually be uh, due to that. Is that because CN is tracing a different layer um, that is less enriched in 15N than HCN that is coming from a lower layer. Um, mm -hmm. So just to summarize this part, um, we now have two observations of resolved uh, isotopic ratios in disks. So in v 4046 h and W Hydra, and in both we find that the fractionation ratio it's increasing as a function of radius, so it's higher in the inner disk compared to the outer disk. Um, and this, uh, going back to the explanation of why this is happening, uh, this is very consistent consistent to the fact that the, um, the mechanism producing these vaccination ratios is the selective uh, photodissociation. And this is something that has been studied uh, by chemical in chemical models. So this is a uh, work by Will Bisset in 2018 where he used the thermochemical code DALI uh, to try to explain these different um, vaccination ratios in different molecules, including uh, and not including a selective, uh, isotope selective for the dissociation. And he actually found that uh, the HCN at least values and also for CN are 
completely dominated by this mechanism. So if you turn off the selective for the association, you are not going to produce such high levels of vaccination as the ones that we observe. One interesting thing though from this model is that they predict that the HCN over HCN15N values are pretty similar to what you should get from, H from CN. Uh, so just another thing to double check and look in more sources to really um, confirm if these values are different or, uh, or not, uh, and if that depends on the disk, etc. <coughs> Um, so, take away from um, these studies of vaccination um, in disks. So the values that we find over the six disks, uh, or five disks, where we have detections, the ratios that we get are about 100 and 200. This is very similar to what you find in comets and the cold ISM. Um, in the two disks where we are able to resolve these profiles, we find that the vaccination is increasing as a function of distance uh, from the start. Um, and this suggests that uh, there is a very efficient uh, selective for the dissociation in the inner disk that is enriching HCN in, in the heavier isotope uh, 15N. And finally, one thing that remains to be um, studied in more detail, I think, is the difference between CN and HCN, the difference in the vaccination levels that we find for these two uh, molecules, and if they are truly uh, tracing similar layers or they are coming from completely different layers in the disk. Um, very briefly, I just wanted to mention, these are all very simple and small molecules. <laughs> there are larger nitrogen-bearing species that are detected in disks. Um, so the most complex ones are uh, methylcyanide and also HC3N. So methylcyanide mm -hmm. uh, detected with carrying in 2015 in MWC480, the Herbig A star. Um, this is uh, kind of surprising but exciting at the same time. Um, very shortly, well, after a few years uh, later, we are starting to see these lines in many other disks. So um, nitrogen berry species seem to be very bright in, in protoplanetary disks. So this is another example in TW Hydra by Ryan. Uh, and more recently also, there was a survey uh, in, with detections in five or six disks um, where you see all of these lines in these disks as well. So methyl cyanide, HC3M, these are bright. Even they're complex, but they're bright in protoplanetary disks. Um, so, what's uh, next after this? Um, I just mm -hmm. outlined, uh, outlined uh, three points that I'm interested in, actually. <laughs> um, so, the first thing is that we're doing very detailed stu studies in single sources. Uh, this is uh, time consuming in the sense of uh, observatory time, <laughs> but it's actually very necessary if you really want to understand what's going on. Uh, you need to have lots of data for each source. Um, another thing that we are starting to move on now is to be able to have larger samples. Um, so far, mo most of the studies that we do are uh, six or less, or maybe ten now with Jenny, <laughs> gathering archival data. Uh, and this is important because we really want to know if the results that we are finding are um, representative of all of the all disks or are we just studying disks that are very weird and, and, and unique, right? Um, also, the different environment conditions we want to understand. So all of these disks are very isolated. Uh, I am very interested to know what happens when you have uh, nearby all stars that are radiating. Um, this will change, and not maybe not, um, but probably yes. <laughs> they will change. They will change something of the chemistry. And I actually have a program of this. Um, to study specifically this, I'm very excited to see what's there. Um, and lastly, uh, resolution, right? Uh, we started with ALMA, very conservative, with 25 arc second resolution, larger beam. Uh, we are now moving to a higher resolution to really be able to understand what is happening at smaller scale. So most of the results we have so far tells us information about what's happening in the outer disk, um, but we want to know what's happening in the inner disk right now. Um, uh, this is just an example of um, a detailed study that you can do in one source. So this is from uh, Kastner 2018, uh, line survey. In one source, there is also a very nice survey by Elsa Cliffs in the NTW Hydra. Um, just to point out the resolution. So these lines are actually the same that I showed <laughs> in my data, but just at higher resolution. So this is point two. This is what you see. Uh, sorry, that's about 0.5, and when you go to 0.2, you really start to see uh, structure rings and stuff. 
Um, but can we go even further? So again, back to D sharp. This is a very exquisite resolution to see the distribution of the dust. What is happening with the gas? And that is something that we would like to know. Um, and that is why I'm here actually this week. <laughs> so we have this large program with current CPI uh, maps uh, to really map the emission of different molecules in five disks. So still with a small sample, but this is expensive. So on this program, for example, it's 130 hours just to do uh, five disks, but doing um, very detailed studies. So high resolution, but also many, many lines with four spectral settings. So I think this will tell us um, a lot of the new information and, and also a lot of questions <laughs> as well. Um, with that, I'm done. Thank you. Question, Jane. Uh, this isn't a question, but I think since Viviana was too modest to say it herself, Viviana is the co-PI of this on the large program. Well, we're, we're five co-PIs. Thank, thank you, Jane. <laughs> and has taken significant leadership in leading the data reduction for this program. Yes. Thank you, Jane. That is a very appropriate acknowledgement, acknowledgement of the, um, the, the, this role. This, this, this is the fun part, actually. <laughs> We've counted several times on the yes. small size of your sample. Is the limit just availability of alma time, or is the limit on the number of stars that are close enough to do this work? No, it's the, the, the time that it takes to observe this with, the, with alma. It's very so time there consuming. There are targets. There are targets, yeah. yeah. But, I mean, this is five sources, and 130 hours, for example. So, <laughs> By yeah. comparison, to get the C sharp, Images which are gorgeous, right? It was about 60 hours for 20 solar Yeah. So that's just. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Lines are weaker, unfortunately. <laughs> Yes. Yep. So that's, uh, it's obviously very challenging to do it spatially resolved, but it, can you use just the velocity information? Because these are nice Keplerian disks, and you can yeah. take the uh, HCN ratios as a function of velocity. Maybe that gets you even closer in. You can, yeah, you can definitely do that, and that's something that we also try to take advantage, because we have very good uh, spectral resolution. Um, but the image tells you other stuff <laughs> you cannot get but from the quicker, velocity. it's quicker, cheaper to... But yeah, yeah, you can get some information from there. Of course, th there's another component. Other, you know, there's the ice component in addition to the gas. And I'm wondering, there is a, a an XCN feature at four and a half microns, ice feature. Uh, and given the rather large ratio of 14N to 15N, I'm wondering if there are any differences in the profile of that ice feature uh, that depend on this ratio? I don't think we have the resolution to to do that, but... Um, well, I mean, JWST may. I mean, when you're talking about oh. resolution, I'm, I'm not talking about spatial resolution mm -hmm. here, exactly. but in the spectral domain, uh, whether the, the shape of the profile uh, varies as that uh, uh, for the ice feature for yeah. the ice feature at four at, I mean, I'm thinking of the one at four and a half microns there may be yeah. others uh, but I'm wondering if the profile of that ice feature for the ice changes. <laughs> um, so I think in theory you could resolve the diff if it's if it's HCN or OCN minus like pure pure ice you could resolve the the differences between a, a 14 and a 15 and feature However, I think even with Webb, James Webb, we are not going to be able to see it, especially not in disks. I mean, even in the brightest protostars, the, this cyanide feature is one of the weaker ones, especially towards solar type protostars. Uh, it's there at sort of a few per mil compared to the water ice features. So when you then drop another factor of 100, even with James Webb, maybe towards massive protostars, you would be able to do it, but uh, it would it would be hard even in those sort of extreme cases. I think just from a sort of feasibility. So case. when you say protostar, I mean uh, uh, ISO saw the XCN feature, ice that's, feature. That's right. Uh, but are, are you saying that you don't expect that to be very prominent in protoplanetary disks? So in Loma's protostars, uh, you do see it some of the time, but it's weak compared to what ISO saw towards the massive protostars. So they're extrapolating from there, like. Let's say that you have the same sort of C 
CO2 to cyanide feature in discs compared to the protostars, it will be difficult to see in discs, even if the normal cyanide feature will be difficult to see in discs. Mm -hmm. So then going another <coughs> factor of 100, it's, um, I will be very happy if we see the cyanide feature in discs, which I really hope mm -hmm. we will, but I mean, even that will be quite challenging. But, but with, with SphereX, we'll be looking at a lot of them, so. Yeah. Uh, Maybe we can stack scoop, them up. Scoop, well, or, yeah. or, or scoop up a few that yeah. are illuminating. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, uh, it will be exciting to see, but... Uh, so you'll try, I guess. <laughs> oh, Jenny, you'll try. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very literal about re words like reservoir of nitrogen. So where is most of the nitrogen in these systems? Is it in the N2. molecules you're looking at, or is it N2? N2, probably, yeah. yeah. Yes, yeah, so basically the dissociation of N2 uh, determines where yeah. probably see it. Yeah. Okay, plot. Yeah, so I was wondering, because in some of the plots that for instance show the C12 over C50 ratios, especially when you go to like larger um, AU, mm -hmm. uh, it showed very large uncertainties, compared yes. to like some others where it was kind of the uncertainty was the same over the entire case. Um, so I was just wondering what's the uncertainty, is it just the luminosity of the... So, so for all of them, if the, the uncertainty goes higher when you go, uh, yeah. For 12C and 13C, it's just higher everywhere, so that's why it looked uh, um, a bit worse. But yeah, this is sensitivity, that when you go to the edges, the RMS is just, when you're going into the noise, so the uncertainty just gets <coughs> higher, yeah. Yeah, so there's Any last question for Viviana? Otherwise, uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Well, it's a, 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 it's a,